This is James Leon Holmes. Uh, he goes by Leon, not by James. Uh, but he was the president of the Arkansas Right to Life group. Uh, he headed up in Arkansas an effort to amend the state's constitution to ban all abortion, even in instances where the pregnancy could hurt the mother or where it was caused by incest or where it was caused by rape. The idea that being a rape victim might be enough to excuse you from the state forcing you to carry a child to term, that idea really got under James Leon Holmes' skin. He wrote a letter once to the editor of the Moline Daily Dispatch explaining that people should stop worrying about rape victims in cases like this. He said, quote, concern for rape victims is a red herring because concep conceptions from rape occur with approximately the same frequency as snowfall in Miami. That's James Leon Holmes. He wrote that in 1980. During the George W. Bush administration, President Bush gave him a lifetime appointment as a federal judge. Uh, James Leon Holmes is now the chief judge of the Eastern District Federal Court in the state of Arkansas. This is Clayton Williams. In 1990, Clayton Williams was the Republican candidate for governor of Texas. He was running against Democrat Ann Richards. Ann Richards beat him pretty well in the general election, but not before Clayton Williams told reporters that rape was a little bit like the weather. As long as it was inevitable, women should just lay back and enjoy it. In June 2008, Clayton Williams was scheduled to headline a fundraiser for then Republican presidential candidate John McCain. He was scheduled to headline that fundraiser until people started asking about whether John McCain agreed with old Clayton Williams about when women should just enjoy rape. Then the McCain campaign canceled the fundraiser. In 1988, a longtime anti-abortion leader in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives argued for criminalizing abortion even for rape victims by saying this, quote, the odds are one in millions and millions and millions that a woman would get pregnant from being raped. And why is that? He had an explanation. He said, rape obviously is a traumatic experience. When that traumatic experience is undergone, a woman secretes a certain secretion, which has a tendency to kill sperm. In 1995, a Republican state representative in North Carolina, a man named Henry Aldridge, made his case that rape victims should not be spared from a new crackdown on abortion rights. He said because, quote, the facts show that people who are raped, who are truly raped, the juices don't flow, the body functions don't work, and they don't get pregnant. He said, quote, to get pregnant, it takes a little cooperation. In 1998, in Arkansas, again, the Republican U.S. Senate candidate running against Blanche Lincoln, a man named Faye Boozman, was reported in a local Arkansas paper to have told a crowd at a political gathering that there was no need for a rape victim's exception to making abortion criminal because of something he described as God's little shield. He later denied using the exact phrase, God's little shield, but he did explain further that based on anecdotal information he had collected as an ophthalmologist, he knew for a fact that real rape victims could not get pregnant from a rape, biologically speaking. In 1999, the former president of the National Right to Life Committee published an article that anti-abortion activists still link to online today. It says the same thing all those Republican men had been saying for all those years, that, re, uh, that women don't get pregnant when they're raped. Which these guys in the anti-abortion movement and in the anti-abortion movement side of Republican politics keep arguing, they keep making this case in public because it has important policy consequences for them. See, if you can't get pregnant by being raped, then anybody who is pregnant, by definition, was not raped. It cannot have been a rape. No matter what you say, you must have wanted it if you ended up pregnant. And if you wanted it, there's no reason to feel sorry for you and let you end this pregnancy. You should have thought about that before you lured your supposed rapist to do this thing that you obviously secretly wanted. What was the line there? To get pregnant takes a little cooperation. So we know you secretly wanted it, otherwise you wouldn't be pregnant. And we wouldn't now be talking about what the government is going to force you to do with regard to your pregnancy. Exceptions to the government's decisions based on you supposedly being raped, those, these guys see, are, 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 are BS exceptions. Because any woman who says she wants an abortion because her pregnancy is the result of a rape, by definition, she is lying about the rape thing. That's the reasoning here, right? That's why you need to come up with the cockamamie fake science theory if you want to talk about that as a policy.
And so quietly over the last few years, as the Republican Party has sort of slipped its moorings post Bush and Cheney, as, as the party apparatus has largely fallen apart and the conservative movement has really stepped in and taken over in the party's place, as that has happened over the last few years, rape and incest exemptions from Republican abortion bans have sort of fallen out of favor. I mean, there have always been people in Republican politics who thought that rape victims had it too easy and we should stop coddling these rape victims, these lying rape victims who seriously, secretly wanted it. Those folks were always around in anti-abortion politics and in Republican politics, but now, in this Republican Party, they have taken over. It was Sarah Palin's position in 2008 as the Republicans' vice presidential nominee that there should be no exceptions for rape and incest victims when the party would criminalize abortion. In 2010, it was the position of a whole bunch of Republican Senate candidates. Sharon Engel, as the Republican U.S. Senate candidate in Nevada in 2010, she said the government forcing a rape victim to bear the rapist's child should be thought of as a way of making lemons out of lemonade. Abolishing rape and incest exemptions was also championed that same year, 2010, by Christine O'Donnell in Delaware. She lost. Uh, by Joe Miller in Alaska. He lost. Uh, and by Rand Paul in Kentucky. He won. It was also championed, of course, by Ken Buck in Colorado. Ken Buck lost a Senate seat in 2010 in Colorado, a seat that Republicans never otherwise should have had any business losing. I am pro-life, and I'll answer the next question. Um, I, I don't believe in the exceptions of rape or incest. The Ken Buck position is not an outlying position for the Republican Party anymore. It has become the new Republican normal. I mean, yes, so-called personhood amendments to ban all abortions, including for rape and incest victims, and to also ban hormonal birth control and many fertility treatments. Those personhood amendments got voted down by huge margins in 2008 in Colorado, and in 2010 in Colorado, and in 2011, even in Mississippi. But by the following year, by 2012, by February 2012, in the Republican presidential primary, Ron Paul and Newt Gingrich and Rick Perry and Rick Santorum had all signed on to personhood as their policy position. Rick Perry even went so far as to repent on the campaign trail this year for previously saying there should be rape and incest exemptions to criminalizing abortion. This year, Rick Perry said that watching one of Mike Huckabee's DVDs changed his mind, and now he, too, believes that rape and incest victims should be forced by the state to give birth against their will. In New Hampshire, in Georgia, in Indiana, in Virginia, in Idaho, in South Carolina, in, Ida in Iowa, excuse me, Republicans in all of those states in the past couple of years have moved to overtly go after rape victims and incest victims in anti-abortion laws, removing protections that they used to have in law. In the House of Representatives, federally, when Republicans voted on a new abortion ban for Washington, D.C. recently, it of course had no exemptions for rape victims or incest victims. H.R. 3, the third bill introduced by the Republican majority when they took over the House after the 2010 elections, H.R. 3 was not just a federal rollback of abortion rights, it initially tried to redefine rape in federal law, creating a new category called forcible rape. What I guess you might think of as real rape to what? Distinguish it from non-forcible rape, the kind of rape women secretly want and like? Republicans, upon taking control of the House, in their third bill, sought to redefine rape because the old definition of rape apparently included too many things that women wanted to be protected from when we all know they were the kinds of rape that are really no big deal. Paul Ryan, the Republican vice presidential nominee, was an original co-sponsor of the bill to redefine rape, to make it harder on rape victims who wanted to get an abortion. The bill eventually dropped the redefining rape language, but Paul Ryan was a sponsor of the bill while the original language was still in there. He was also a sponsor of the federal version of the personhood thing that had failed in Colorado twice and in Mississippi. Because even in Mississippi, personhood language that would ban all abortions with no exceptions at all, including for rape or incest, and would also likely ban hormonal birth control and some fertility treatments, that was too extreme for Mississippi, but Paul Ryan sponsored it for the whole country. Paul Ryan also sponsored a federal version of Bob McDonald's forced ultrasound bill from Virginia, in which the government forces women to have a medically unnecessary procedure against their will and potentially against doctor's orders because the government wants it. Paul Ryan's bill for doing that at the federal level had no exemptions for rape or incest.